May this message lead you to a deep reflection on the processes and tools of self-transformation provided by the renowned Yogi Sadhguru. If you want to start your yoga journey with Sadhguru, click on the link in the description of this video and learn more. Body remembers, isn't it? 100 percent. It doesn't matter where you go, what you do in your life, this body retains every bit of that memory, isn't it? So, this existence is memory, but do you want to use this body and this bank of memory that you have in your mind as a platform upon which you sit or do you want to carry this on your head? This is the difference. Being conscious means you sit on this platform. Being unconscious means you carry it on your head, the burden of it. You mentioned um, artificial intelligence. Are you worried about the future? No, this is the best time for me <laughs> 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 See, <laughs> if let us say right now you have read ten thousand things and you remember all that, I have not read anything. So the value that you have is only the memory you have. But now I have a little gadget which knows a million times more than you know. So now what is the value for you and me? What kind of a human being I am is the only value, isn't it? What nonsense you carry in your head is of no value. <laughs> so this is a great time for me. <laughs> this is great time for humanity because now you being a human being will become more important than what nonsense you carry in your head. I'm sorry, this is head talk <laughs> <laughs> So are you saying then that we are living in the best time in history? Definitely. Is there any question? Never before human survival was as well organized as it is today. In, if you had to start your morning, you had to take a bucket and go to River Thames, which is a mile away, <laughs> and carry this bucket full of water. Tell me in this room how many people are even fit enough to carry a bucket full of water <laughs> for a mile. <laughs> now we are complaining because the warm water is not coming. <laughs> there are two… there are two knobs you have to turn for warm and cold water. You want a single knob so people are freaking in the morning. Two knobs <laughs> have to handle. <laughs> so, survival is better organized than ever before. When our concern was survival, we couldn't pay attention to other dimensions of life. See, once you come as a human being, if you had come as any other creature, Stomach full, life settled. Once you come as a human being, stomach empty, only one problem, stomach full, one hundred problems. <laughs> Why this is so is, our life is not fulfilled with survival. When our survival is in question, we are just like any other creature. Only when survival is fulfilled, the dimensions of being human kicks in into our experience. When you're thinking of where is my next meal, we don't expect you to be very human. You, you lose it in many ways. Now survival is settled for large part of humanity. Unfortunately, there's still populations for whom it's still a struggle. But I would say at least for sixty percent of the population on the planet for the first time, survival is better organized than ever before. The world is safer than ever before, though people are constantly complaining. Well, you're talking about Sri Lanka, yes, it's an unfortunate incident. But thousand years ago, if thousand people died just hundred miles away, you would be sitting here thinking world is super peaceful. Yes or no? Today it's because of BBC <laughs> that somebody dies somewhere, the blood flows into your sitting room. It's a good thing, at least your humanity is being evoked, otherwise it will sleep. So I am saying, in terms of violence, we are more peaceful than ever before. Our survival is organized better than ever before and above all, our ability to communicate is better than ever before. These are not small things. Now the question is, what are we going to communicate? Are we going to abuse each other? Are we going to throw dirty, uh, dirty things at each other? Or are we going to do something that will transform us as a generation because this is our time on the planet. Are we going to make this the greatest time on, in the world ever 
or are we going to let this pass? That's all we have on our hands. What else do we have? That's all we have. All we have is a little bit of time, isn't it? Hello? <laughs> all we have is a little bit of time. But most people think they're immortal. <laughs> That's why they don't do anything. Because they think only other people die. They don't understand you and me will die. When… when we are born, we are geared to die. So it's only a question of time. Time is ticking away right now. As you sit here, from the time we came and sat here, we are twenty minutes closer to our graves, all of us <laughs> Yes, if you are conscious, if you think about death once in a way, it will become a morbid thought. But if you are conscious that you are mortal, you would organize your time in the most productive possible way, isn't it? Are you worried about global leadership though? I mean, you, you say we, we're living in the best time that we… it's the best time for us in terms of survival and uh, technology, but if we look at the global phenomenon at the moment, I mean, even if we look at what's happening in this country with Brexit and identity politics and people feeling like they need to belong to a certain type of thinking or group on either side of the spectrum, is that not dividing us more and more? See, I think uh, this reaction is happening not just here in many places across the world. I've been talking to media and others saying, don't push the pendulum too much on one side, it'll inevitably <coughs> swing the other way around. So people have been pushing it too much on one side about politically being correct, saying the right word, not the right thing. The right word you must use. If… if I say mankind, Women will react. <laughs> I'm saying, is, is, is everybody so screwed up in their head, all the time they're discriminatory? I don't think so. Some people are, of course. But today it's become like this. You know, it, it was very natural for me if you see a child, you want to pick up the child, you want to do something, you want to talk to them, you want to hug them, whatever, because it's… it's like a fresh flower. But today, you don't know whether to touch the child or not because people are making such a big deal about it. I am not saying there are no issues, there are serious issues, this which needs to be addressed. But at the same time when we push it to a paranoia level, instead of taking necessary steps, we make it a paranoia among people, then the other swing is inevitably going to come. Now somebody is saying, don't worry about all this ecological nonsense, nothing is going to happen. Uh, everything is fine, let us, you know, let's do everything as it is because this is all rubbish, mm. because you pushed it too much. This is very important to understand people who are concerned th in this world. If you are a concerned human being, it's very important whatever you think is right, you must not push it too much. If you push it too much, the reverse pendulum will anyway happen, you are seeing that right now. Talking about Brexit, is it okay? <laughs> because I think you already made up your mind, so <laughs> See, could you… could you sell this idea to anybody in 1945? 1945, could you sell this idea that Germans, French, Italians, Spanish, English all come together as a union? Could you even think, I'm asking, after… World War II. So in fifty years' time, when such a thing happens, it's not just an economic arrangement, it's a huge step in human consciousness that with people that you fought so bitterly, bitterly means it can't be any worse, human beings can't find any worse than that. After that, within fifty years, when the generation is still alive, Many members of that generation are still alive. You thought of coming together, it's not a small thing. It's not just economic arrangement, it's not just, just euro versus your pound or whatever. It is a tremendous step for humanity. But now you want to go back on it? It's done. <laughs> <laughs> on that note. <laughs> On that note, I, I just want to open up uh, to the audience and, and give you a chance to ask uh, some questions from, from Sadhguru. Just stand up, introduce yourself and we'll start here at, in the, on the front row. I'm Inakshi and I work in technology, Sadhguru. So thrilled and privileged to be here, feeling blessed. Thank you. My question is that um, 
In Kali Yuga, is it possible to um, take the Advaitic meditative route to try and get your uh, get in touch with your consciousness without a guru and the guru mantra? Or should one pursue uh, Namasmaran and Bhakti Marg as the way one tries everything but is flapping in the wind? <laughs> <laughs> See, you are a technology person and I'm asking all of you, well, each one of you may have your own uh, religious beliefs or whatever, but please look at it sincerely. Your belief is only to a point of convenience, isn't it so? Are you willing to believe to such an extent? You have children? Children? Yes. yes. So, are you willing to leave the future of your children in God's hands and leave it? Just do Namsmaran and leave them on the street. Because, <laughs> are you? street is also in God's hands, right? Are you capable? No. Are you willing to leave your home, doors open, your wealth, everything open? because God is there anyway. <laughs> no, you do everything that matters to you. You're keeping God as insurance, <laughs> all right? So, when you're in this state of mind, don't talk about devotion, it won't work. Devotion is a fantastic thing. Devotion is another dimension of intelligence. But with the kind of education that you've gone through and your, intelli your intelligence has become very skewed, just by exercising one aspect, that is the intellect. Right now, our education systems are exercising only one dimension of your intelligence, that is just the intellect. If I ask you a simple question, would you want your intellect to be sharp or blunt, all of you? Make a choice, I'm going to bless you <laughs> So you want it sharp, so essentially it's a cutting instrument. So, let us say you have one knife in your hand and you want to do all the activity of your life with the knife. Well, you can cut things well with a knife. But if you want to stitch your clothes, you use a knife. You will inevitably be in tatters, isn't it? <laughs> that's all that's happening today. Because you're exercising just one dimension of your intelligence, which is the intellect, which is a discriminatory sharp instrument which slices open, dissects things. Now, I want to know something physical, I want to dissect it. Now I want to know you, shall we dissect you? <laughs> Is that the way to know you, I'm asking? If I dissect you, will I know anything about you? Is it possible, I'm asking? By embracing you, by including you, I may know something. By dissecting you, what will I know? What is… what will work for a physical substance, you're trying to apply to your own life. It's not going to work like this. See, the more educated people are becoming, the more disturbed they're becoming. Education should have settled them, isn't it? Education should have enhanced life. But tell me, who is causing maximum damage on this planet, educated people or un uneducated people? Hello? Educated people, isn't it? Educated people should have been the solution. Educated people are the problem. Simply because we are using a knife for everything. If you want <laughs> this thing, you know, I, there was a time when I was crisscrossing India on my motorcycle. So one whole night I've been riding. I'm somewhere between Madhya Pradesh and Uttar Pradesh. I don't know which state, somewhere around there in the border. So early morning around 6.30, I end up at a tea shop. Full night I've been riding. Then, uh, you know, mo people who ride motorcycles, they will know one problem is always that every five hundred kilometers those days, the chain will become slack. So you have to take off a link and put it back, <laughs> tighten the chain. This is a very easy job, but it's messy because of the grease and stuff, your hands will become messy. So I'm just about preparing for breakfast, I'm not willing to mess. Then I see on the opposite side a shack which says Mubarak Mechanical Works. Then I see a young boy there and I say, hey, can you tighten my chain? He said, yes, yes, full enthusiasm. Then he goes inside and brings his tools. What he brings? He brings a chisel and a hammer. <laughs> then I say, what, you going to do with that? He said, yeah, I can do it. I said, wait. Then I walk into his garage and look, only what he has is chisel and hammer. <laughs> <laughs> he can fix it, but after that, that's the end of it. <laughs> 
So right now, this is what you're trying to do. You are trying to fix everything with the sharpness of your intellect. You will become a mess. The more you do it, more mess you will become. You only satisfaction you have is, you know words and things that other people do not know, but you are a total mess. Yes, because the other dimensions of intelligence have not been opened up in the society, largely. Not everybody, but largely. The systems, there are no systems to open up other dimensions of intelligence. So when we say devotion, we are talking about a completely different dimension of intelligence. Devotion is not about belief. Devotion is not about going to a temple, church or mosque. Tell me, is there anybody in this world, either in sport, art, music, business, spirituality, whatever, has anybody done anything significant without being absolutely devoted to what they are doing? Hmm? Has it happened? So devotion is another dimension of intelligence. If you exercise that, life will be very beautiful. But it does not mean that you can simply believe that its devotion has become deception because it's a deal. Right now the deal is like this, dear God, I will give you ten pounds, will you give me million? <laughs> Something in her homework. Then the mother was feeling uncomfortable, she finished her cooking and then the girl had finished her homework and left the book there, she went and read. So the essay was about the family tree. So the girl had written, for three generations in my family, nobody had a natural birth <laughs> So because of absurd ideas, either we exaggerate something or we try to unnecessarily play it down. It has a certain role in your life. If you make it too big, you will become perverted in your head. If you try to obliterate it, you will become even more perverted in your mind. After all, now I am speaking, this is a kind of energy. You are looking at me, this is a kind of energy. You are listening to me, this is a kind of energy. These are different expressions of the same life energy, isn't it? Now sexuality is also another expression of the same energy. Now one has to decide how much of his energy, in which direction he wants to send it. Because after all, you are a limited amount of energy, isn't it? See, it's just like you have an income. Let's say you have five thousand dollars a month. How much for the house rent? How much for eating? How much for schooling? How much just for fun? How much for vacation? You a portion, isn't it? Tomorrow morning, you got your salary. In the evening, you went out and blew it up. Now the next month is going to be trouble, isn't it? Of course, you have a credit card, but <laughs> Everything in your life, if you are handling your life sensibly, everything in your life is apportioned according to your understanding, your need and your capability, isn't it so? Yes? Your money, time, energy, isn't everything allotted the way you like to arrange it? This is also the same thing. How much of it? First of all, do you need it? Or are you doing it because of socially you're psyched? If there is a need, if I ask you to stop it, you will become perverted because it'll all happen in your head. If somebody is telling you, you have to do it, if you don't do it, you're not normal, another kind of perversion will come, both are not needed. After all, you're not going after a man or woman, you're going after a certain level of pleasantness. So once you experience a certain level of pleasantness, wouldn't you like to dig deeper into this? Because whatever pleasantness happened, maybe you use the other person, but the pleasantness happened within you, right? So suppose anyway the pleasantness is happening within you, the other person is just a key to open this, wouldn't you like to have the key in your own hands? Yes? That if you sit like this, you are on full scale. <laughs>
you don't need anybody. No, see, any… anything, anything in your life, either for pleasure, money, love, this, that, it doesn't matter what, for whatever, the moment you become dependent on another person, nobody on this planet is truly reliable, isn't it? I keep hearing these complaints all over. Some people, generally women, keep complaining their husbands are excessively physical. Some women constantly complaining, he doesn't lay a finger upon me. Whatever happens, it's a problem because it'll never happen exactly the way you want it. As long as another person is involved, nothing will ever happen hundred percent the way you want it, isn't it so? Yes or no? It never will. It doesn't matter if you get married to your God, it still won't happen. As long as your way of being, your sense of pleasure and joy is dependent on other person, you will always have a complaint. Doesn't matter how wonderful the other person is. So in this context, people might have talked about celibacy because they said, take some time off. Don't… because to extract pleasure out of somebody, you have to play any number of tricks. It's… it's the, it doesn't happen simply. This is called as courting <laughs> Once you go to the court, the judgment day will come <laughs> It takes enormous amount of time, effort, energy and all kinds of other things, frustrations, jealousies, problems, everything attached to it. So somebody said, take time off from those things and see if this could be internally generated and then being with people will become more out of your love than out of your need, which is definitely a better way to be with people, isn't it? Which is definitely a better way of honoring another human being, isn't it so? Give this a little more attention. Instead of paying attention to that one and that one and that one, give this one a little more attention it will produce much more pleasure than any other one can produce for you. What means focus to you and, and which way can we apply focus in our daily life? So what's your definition of focus? Okay. Oh, uh, there are many ways to describe this word. Instead of saying focus, if you use the word attention, would you agree? that attention and focus are about the same thing? There is a little difference, there is… there are nuances to it. But when you say focus, it's just like focusing a light on something means only a focus is always a spot. Attention can be much more widespread. See, right now, if you have clear vision, I am having problems seeing the young man because you kept him in darkness there in the hall <laughs> But if the hall was well lit, I don't have to focus myself to see the people who are sitting here. I just need attention. If I am attentive, I will see all the people here the way they are. But now I get interested in this one young man, then I need focus. If I had only focus without the general attention about everything around me, indiscriminate attention I'm talking about, attention not even about something, just being attentive because… only because there is a certain level of attention and awareness within you, you even know that you exist. Otherwise, let's say in sleep, in your experience, neither the world exists nor you exist, all that's happened is, there is no attention, because there is no attention, there is no perception of any kind. 